In 1934, a boy was born in Czechoslovakia to loving parents who had fled there from Germany, trying to escape from Hitler. His name was Tom. His family was Jewish. They understood what would happen to them under Hitler's rule. They tried desperately to emigrate. Unfortunately, they were not successful. In 1944, they were arrested, deported, and interned in Auschwitz. Tommy was only 10 years old. In a memoir written decades later, he writes of the horror of their deportation and imprisonment. In one particularly memorable passage, he recounts that in 1945, he found himself again on a train, this time headed back to Germany because it was the end of the war and the Allies were advancing. It was an open car this time. It was cold. There was snow and wind swirling all around. It was crowded. People were dying. They were starving. He says, as the train pulled into Berlin, he heard a German woman exclaim loudly, it stinks of Jews again. But an hour later, he says, our new SS guard climbed down from the train onto the platform and he got himself a cup of coffee he saw Tommy looking at the cup, and without a word, he turned and handed it to that little boy, his first hot drink in over a week. We don't know why the guard gave Tom the cup of coffee. Maybe he thought he looked like his child, or after all, he was a child and he was shivering and he was cold. But what we can tell is that he could see his humanity, and the woman could not. Tom's father died in the camps, but he and his mother survived. They were reunited. She found a new life in Italy, and he eventually emigrated to the United States. He decided to study law because he thought if international law and human rights law could be developed and strengthened, maybe that could stop bad things happening, like what had happened to him and his family. He became a human rights lawyer and a distinguished professor at George Washington University. And then one day he was elected to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And he became known not only for the brilliance of his legal opinions, but for his continued compassion and commitment to human rights and justice. In his memoir, he writes of himself as lucky. He says, I was a lucky child because I survived. And he took that survival as a call to action to help others. And he never forgot that hot cup of coffee in winter. Tom understood that international law and international institutions could stop bad things happening to people in the future. This notion of international law that endows each one of us with inalienable rights and imposes obligations on the powerful not to commit terrible crimes. This crystallized during the Second World War as a direct response to the Nazi atrocities. It found voice in the Nuremberg trials of the major war criminals that were held on charges of crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggressive war. It led to the establishment of the United Nations, a body that was hoped could prevent war and the creation of a security council that could enforce the peace. A new word, genocide, was coined to describe mass slaughter, and a treaty was adopted to prevent and punish it, and work on a new international criminal court that could be the permanent embodiment of the Nuremberg trials was begun. But for the next 50 years, all over the world, tens of millions of people suffered the same kind of atrocities that Tom and his family had endured. People were killed because they were from the wrong religion. People were made to disappear because they were from the wrong political party. They were beaten, they were tortured, they were enslaved, subjected to sexual violence. The list goes on and on. We had the law. We had the rules that said this was all illegal and criminal behavior. But under the Cold War, that Cold War politics prevented us from creating the institutions that could enforce those rules. And those institutions that did exist were not able to be effective. 
That changed in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The collapse of the Soviet Union ushered in a new era of optimism and excitement about international law and institutions. Work on the permanent International Criminal Court could finally resume. And in 1998, 250 organizations from all over the world joined forces with 165 governments to meet in the city of Rome and draft a constitution for a new global institution, a permanent international criminal court. But this court can only work if we all support it. Defendants have to be arrested. States have to stop offering refuge to dictators and strongmen. 123 states have joined the court. And as you can see from the map, that's a thrilling achievement. But you can also see that there are many large and powerful states that have yet to join, who are still sitting on the sidelines. And these include the United States, Russia, and China. It would be easy to be discouraged, given the indifference of the great powers, given the enormity of the crimes, given the cruelty of the world. And let's face it, 2019 is not 1998. International law and international institutions are under siege in a new era of ethno-nationalism. But survivors don't give up, because survivors can't. I'd like to share with you a story of another survivor. Her name is Nadia Morad. You may have heard of her. A beautiful young Yazidi woman from the village of Kocho in Iraq. She was captured by ISIS fighters in 2014. She was tortured, starved, beaten, raped, and enslaved. She and her mother lost everything. Almost all of her family was killed. And the ISIS fighters bought her and her friends as if they were cattle. She wanted to die. But one day, the man who had purchased her left, and he left her alone. And she decided, something welled up inside her, and she decided to escape. She fled. She disguised herself. A Muslim family sheltered her. And she was able to leave ISIS-held territory and be reunited with her brother. But the amazing thing about Nadia is having done all this, she didn't just protect herself, she turned around to help her community. She wanted to rescue the Yazidi people who were still under ISIS control. She became a spokeswoman for the Yazidi and traveled the entire world telling her story, as upsetting and as traumatic as that was for her. She and her translator even made it all the way to the United Nations in New York and pleaded the case of the Yazidi to the General Assembly and to the Security Council and finally succeeded in getting the Security Council to order an investigation of the atrocities. For this work, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. But her work is not yet over. We can't get the case of the Yazidi to the International Criminal Court because Iraq hasn't joined the court. And the great powers sitting in the Security Council aren't cooperating to send it there, just as we saw during the Cold War. So what do we do? Why should we care, in a way? What should the great powers do? Maybe they just simply don't think it's in their interest to deal with the case of the Yazidi. What's in it for them? What's in it for us? Well, my thesis, my argument, is we should care about what happens to Nadia Murad or Thomas Bergenthal because what, could have, what happened to them could have happened to us had we been born in another place and time. And we are all interconnected. The work of the great political theorist John Rawls can help us think about this. In his classic text, A Theory of Justice, Rawls tells us that the way we should think about justice is to think about it from behind what he calls a veil of ignorance. 
this original position from which we don't know in advance what privileges and social status we would be born with or acquire later. And that's the system of justice we should choose. To put it another way, in my world, if you didn't know if you were going to be Jewish or Christian in Hitler's Germany, or Tutsi or Hutu during the Rwandan genocide, or Yazidi or Sunni in modern day Iraq, what system of justice would you choose? My argument is that you would choose rules that promote social equality and non-discrimination because you would recognize that they could be you had you been born in another place or time. And so you would choose the rules that would protect your future vulnerable self. Nadia Murad and Thomas Bergenthal instinctively understood this. In her memoir entitled, The Last Girl, Nadia writes that what the Yazidi community want is they want ISIS prosecuted for genocide. And what she wants is she wants to look into the eyes of the men who raped her and see them stand trial. But even more than that, she adds, I want to be the last girl in the world with a story like mine. The stories of Nadia Murad and Thomas Bergenthal and so many like them, these are stories of hope, of perseverance, of justice. They embody the triumph of the human spirit over the debasement of evil. And they show us the power of deeply committed individuals working together to make a profound difference in the world. But they also show us, I think, that making global justice work isn't always about changing the entire course of human history. It's about using our ability to recognize our common humanity and make a difference in the world. Sometimes it's as simple as offering a shivering child a hot cup of coffee in winter. Or it's as big as convincing the entire international community that your community is worth saving. Or it's about going to school and getting an education and acquiring the skills you need to, to be in a profession where you can make a difference. It may sometimes feel that the problems are too big and we are just too small and insignificant to make a difference. But I'd like to leave you with some words of encouragement from an African proverb that a colleague at the International Criminal Court shared with me. If you ever feel that you are too small to make a difference, it's because you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. Thank you.